just getting everything started up. All right, I'm going to go live with this, okay? Thank you. Sure. Well, hello there, Fraser. <laughs> now we're live. Yes, we have. We haven't. Um, we haven't been dealing with this for the last what hour and a half. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. Um, there we go. The moon again. Yeah. The moon. Our old friend, the moon. Our trusty. Uh, astronomical target is the moon tonight again but that's because uh, it's dependable and bright yes actually the scenes really improved I think yeah I think it helps that we drop the power made out so this is mm -hmm. um, this is the 14 inch Newtonian it's an f4.5 which is a focal length of I think 1600 millimeters and this is the native focal length here there's no no magnification in here at all. And it's using, believe it or not, a FireWire camera. Don't ask us how we got FireWire cameras to plug into the Google Hangouts, because that was a bear. <laughs> that, that, was a, that was half an hour. Yeah. yeah. So it's a 640 by 480 monochrome camera. It's the Point Grey Research Flea 3. And we're actually using the red filter right now. And it doesn't look red because the camera doesn't see color. Right. Uh, red is typically the steadiest of all the filters, too. You know, what's interesting is we can change to the green and see if it makes a difference. Of course, it's way overexposed there, isn't it? Now? Yeah. Oh, great. Hello. Who's joined us? Okay, I'm gonna. Oh, that's right. I'm gonna click on. <clears throat> cool. There. Oh. This, yep. Was it was it worth the wait, Phil? I don't know yet. Something happened in my window. Uh. No. <laughs> floor Pope. There it is. Ooh. There it is. I thought you'd like that. But now I see you. I have to click on the thingy. But I, I, I'm clicking on the right. For the people outside, hopefully, they should only be seeing the telescope and Lil Phrase and Lil Phil. <laughs> and the disembodied uh, voice of, of uh, telescope operator Mike Phillips. Hello. Holy cow, that is sinus iridium. That's what we were looking at the other day. And Plato. Yeah. So we're live? Yeah, we're live. Yeah, it's broadcasting right now. Ooh, you know what? I'm getting an echo. Let me turn my volume down. Might be me, too. I'll turn you down. There. Hi, Mike. Hey. Nice to e-meet you. Yeah, same here. It's quite a pleasure for me, actually. Big fan. Uh, that's because you don't know me that well. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah, everyone, are you kidding? Everyone in Google Plus is going to be numb and bored of hearing our astronomy uh, <laughs> geek out pretty soon. <laughs> Those guys again? Ah. Oh. I, want now, to watch I need to Big promote Bang this. <clears throat> so let's see. I go to the public one. And I sh oh, do I want to share that? I don't think I want to share that. I think I just want to link to it in Twitter. You want to link? You want to share? You want to go to the one that ends in YQ? Or, you know what? NJS, well, I see the one. Right? There's one listed as public. And there's one list that is limited. The limited is the one we're in, and the public's the one everybody sees. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It, but it, if I share it, you want to share it in. You'll want to share it in Google Plus anyway, right? Yeah, I was thinking about that. If I do that though, um, Google people, will want to leave comments there instead of in the main. Uh, thing. Yes, but they won't it's, know that it's that it's there. So, so I would share it, and then people, in theory, can. Okay, fine. Yeah, just share it. We're live on the moon. Uh, 
Um, so the original plan, we were going to, so, so from last night, last night we had Mike's 8-inch Celestron, and, uh, and tonight we have your 14-inch, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And it's a C14? It, it, well, it's home-built, isn't it? Yeah, it's a Newtonian. Oh! But you home-built it. Yes. So with, last night we had a couple of people who were planning to drop everything and, and order a new telescope, but... This one you can't buy. <laughs> well, uh, I'll build it for you for maybe a 20% premium. <laughs> You'd sell it. You'd sell this one, yeah. Um, oh, but it's, it's good. It's, it's a bit of a, a battle tonight. Uh, we started on Jupiter, and it was, it was pretty nice, but a little hazy. But I think your telescope has, has cooled down a bit, because it's definitely a lot crisper and clear and, and just more stable than it was. But also because we're out, we don't have the bar load, so... Yeah. You know, when we're feeling ambitious, we can take another crack at trying to see Jupiter again. And yeah. also, it's it's a fairly full moon at this point, so um, yeah. it's getting a little uh, hard to see any relief. Although we did get a really nice view just on the limb, right at the terminator, of seeing the 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 craters. It was quite quite nice. Can you move up or down a bit? How's your yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, along the top of the moon, I think, is a... Well, I guess that's the bottom of the moon, isn't it? It's all upside down. Uh, I thought I may have inverted it. It's Can you go the other uh, way? Yeah, you want to go towards the top? Yeah. The top of the camera, how's that? Yeah, the top of the camera, yeah. There we go. And look at that. Look at that. You can just see the, the little nubbin of the mountain right in the middle of that of that crater which we were talking it's about last nice night. Little shadow there too, isn't it? That crater's huge. Yeah. It's bigger than Plato and Plato's big. I, you know, how big did I say Plato was last time? 100 kilometers across? Something like that? That's the one so so what we're looking at here is the is the northern part of the moon and at the upper left, you can see where the sunset line is. Or I guess it's actually the sunrise line. Yeah, it's the sunrise line. So if you were standing right there, you'd see the sun rising very slowly. Because the moon's day, day-night cycle, is, is a month long. And there's that, that gorgeous crater there, and there's a central peak. A lot of big craters have a big mountain in the center. It, um, you can think of it as the when this giant impact, boom, hits the moon, the shock wave moves out and there's a, a resonance, a rebound, and that rock comes screaming back in and, and splashes up in the middle. It's a little bit like when you drop a drop of uh, milk or water in, into a glass and you see that sploosh of dropping, uh, drop comes back up. And uh, that mountain is miles high and you can see its shadow being cast there. That is so cool. That's a nice scope, Mike. You got a nice scene tonight. Yeah, it's it, it called for average, but I think it's starting to settle down a little bit here as the clouds move through. Well, yeah. I will just go pull up my old moon map. Oh, you actually did get the moon map happening. Yeah, I did last time. I was talking about it. When you did it, you crashed everything. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now it's it's holding really steady. You your uh, tracking is pretty good. Yeah. So this. Um, this Newtonian weighs about 65 pounds, so it's on a Celestron CGE mount, which is a little heavier duty, and I, I spent a couple extra minutes aligning it, because it is on some wheelie bars here, and I've got to roll it up the driveway. Actually, it's not even set for lunar tracking, which means that it could actually get a little better if I change it. Oh, you don't have it for lunar tracking. Okay. Yeah, so, so just to uh, explain that to people... Um, the moon is actually moving in relation to the rest of the sky. And so if you want to get a really precise view, you have to switch between sidereal tracking and lunar tracking. And so lunar tracking will, uh, will keep the moon in view, while sidereal tracking will keep the stars and the planets and stuff in view. I don't know, do they make a Jupiter tracking? Is it not uh, necessary? Yeah, probably not. It closely, closely follows sidereal enough, right? Yeah. yeah. This is awkward. This is a little reverse left-right for me, but um, I got a little mouse cursor here with this software package. <laughs> right, so you can, you can kind of yes. 
we're backwards and right upside here. down. Yeah, yeah, zoom in on things. Yeah. And so the the original plan was, um, and this sort of taking too long. We got a little ambitious, I think, was that we had uh, we had a last night's camera bolted on to Mike's uh, spotting scope, and so the plan was to get two feeds in here at the same time. One which was sort of the wide view uh, from the spotting scope, and then one from the from this view as well, and so we could kind of put things in perspective. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was just all kinds of technical fail, and so we've kind of gone retreated to this uh, to this solution, which you know I'm really I'm really pleased. Well, so the the technical detail that that you were um, not convinced would work it was to get a FireWire camera, which is what we're using right now, into the Google Hangout. So with some software magic in that package you, you found called uh, Webcam Studio, we're able to essentially do a desktop share against the right, live right. feed. So, so what we've done, I mean, the, the problem is that a lot of the really good astrophotography mm -hmm. cameras are FireWire. And the Google Hangout is not designed to bring in anything from a FireWire. They, you know, they do it with the USB. And so what we've got here is, is it's coming in through the FireWire into a window in the computer, and then another piece of software is taking that window and turning it into another webcam, but a virtual webcam in the computer, and then pumping that out of the, uh, out of the computer, which can then be recognized as another device by Google Hangout, and then that can be brought in. So in, you know, in theory, he could be screen sharing or you know, showing up anything. Um, but in this case, it's the, it's the window from the, from the telescope. It's 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 been pretty complicated, I gotta say, and I, it's been funny. I've been talking to people all day long. I probably talked to four people today, of, of different levels of uh, sort of at different places in the world. Uh, John Boise, who's uh, one of the contributors to Universe Today, he had his his telescope pointed at the sun, and it was pretty exciting. Um, and then we had oh my kids just got home from the pool so <laughs> um, and then we had uh, Amit Kale who is in Turkey uh, and I think he's watching right now and he, he is then he, either he got up really early or he's been up all night um, but but Amit has connected his uh, uh, Canon T2 camera DSLR camera to the to the back of his telescope and it is. It is un unbelievable. I mean, the quality of the scene that he was getting was, was really neat. And he's, but it's, uh, he was having really high wind and a lot of rain, so he wasn't able to join us for this. Oh, now you're just showing off. Ooh. <laughs> I've got a loud background here, so I'm going to mute my mic and let Phil talk. I was actually um, looking at a moon map trying to identify that big crater that, was, uh, that had that central peak in it, and the sun rising and, and the shadow casting off and it's like it, I'm having a hard time finding it because it's uh, really? it's so far north on the moon that uh, maps from the ground have a hard time seeing it and so I, I, I'm not sure exactly which one it was um, and then I look back and now you're it looks like you're in um, oh, in, in my Latin is terrible Ocean, uh, o Oceanus Procolarum <laughs> huh. Wait, is that right I, I, I'm not sure I'll take your word on that one. And if you want, I can go back. I don't want to get too far ahead of your... No, it's uh, okay. I, it, crater it, by crater I, I navigation. Think it, um, that's what it's got to be because it's so big. Okay, for the, for those of you who... Um, and and I, I just joined the Hangout a, a few minutes ago, so I'm not sure exactly what you guys talked about. Nothing. But, we just but, started. Okay, so when you're looking at the moon, and if you go outside right now and you can see the moon, um, with your eye, there are two overwhelming features. There's bright stuff and there's darker stuff. And the darker stuff looks gray or slate blue. And uh, they look blue enough that when they were named, when people mapped them, even before telescopes were invented, they would draw the moon by eye. They would name these features. And they would name them after lakes and oceans and seas. And uh, one of them is, um, and let me see, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe I can find a way to pronounce it. Oceanus Procolarum. Oceanus Procolarum, is that right? Did I spe yes, I spelled it correctly. Look at that. Um, oh, you know what? Wikipedia has a pronunciation. Let's see if you can hear it when I really? play it. Is it going to play? How do I do this? Oh, it's a... But it has a little speaker thing. When I click it, nothing happens. Well, whatever. It means ocean of storms. And when you're looking at the moon... 
depending on where you are on the earth, but where I am in, in mid latitudes in the northern hemisphere in, in Colorado, it's sort of on the on the left hand side of the moon and it's the gigantic region there. And and what hap what what's going on here is that um these two features are different because uh the bright stuff is what's called highlands, mountains and craters and things like that. Uh what happened was when the moon was young, gigantic asteroid impacts slammed into the moon and magma, lava, boiled up and filled up that basin and made it smooth. And so the cratering happened and then a couple of big impacts happened and, and smoothed over those giant regions. And they're actually made of slightly different materials because some of that stuff was, was basically bubbled up from underneath the surface. And uh, so, so that gives them the two different colors and the two different appearances because uh, the, the mare, as they're called, the, the maria, the seas on the moon are smoother. They're not exactly smooth, uh, all the Apollo missions landed uh, in those those things, and or most of them did, and they're still covered with craters and, and rubble and everything like that. But from a telescope like what we're using tonight, or when you look by the eye, it looks smooth. And it's uh, as you can tell, it's gorgeous. And and actually, yeah, looking at this, you can see big craters. And I love this one crater we're seeing there. And I will have to find it in my map here. Which one are this you looking is, at, Phil? So this one here. Um, it's interesting. The bright one. Oh wow! Look what you can do. No, I was looking at the one at the upper right. This big bright crater that's got the rays around it in the apron. Mm. And so it's it, those uh, those bright rays that are coming out. That means it's a mo much more recent impact than than the the background material. That's right. And I. <clears throat> okay, I see it in a picture, but I don't see it in the map yet. I got to figure this out. Um, this won't take me but a moment. Oh, yes, look at that. I believe that is the crater named Kepler. Now, let me make sure. I'm sure there's like the people watching that are going, it's Kepler! <laughs> Don't yeah, you know, right. Phil, it's Kepler! They're yelling at their... Uh, at their <laughs> right it's been so long since I've, uh, I've sat in an eyepiece and observed the moon. I still do it. Yeah, that's Kepler. Okay, yeah. got it. Oh, and there's that other crater there which is Reiner. Oh, I recognize these now. Okay. The crater on the left that's got the beautiful little shadow uh, on the right-hand side is, is Reiner. And then the one right in the middle is Kepler. Now, this, this crater, let me make sure I got the number on this right. Kepler is big. It's 32 kilometers across, so that's 20 miles. And, uh, uh, you know, Washington, D.C. could fit comfortably inside of that crater with plenty of room to spare. And, and like Fraser said, it's a more recent impact. Um, when, when something comes in and hits the moon, you get all this stuff ejected out in these gorgeous plumes that would come up, and these will settle down, and, and the plumes will feather out like tendrils, and those will leave those nice, long, linear features that you see there that all point right towards ground zero. Um, you also get a lot of stuff that, fall, that goes straight up and falls straight down, and that's the, what's called the... I've heard it called the apron, and I've heard it called a skirt. I don't know if there's a technical term for it, but that's that's all around that too. And you can see this material is all different color than the stuff around it because it's been mixed up and it's it's different uh, grain size on the surface. All kinds of things change the, the the brightness of it. And over time, more meteorite impacts, the solar wind, uh, and and what's called um, thermal flexing. Basically, the night and day cycle of the moon are so huge, the temperature change is so huge, that rocks will crack and collapse. And over billions of years, these features erode. So even though there's no atmosphere and no, no real water on the moon, there's still erosion. And, uh, you know, if you came back and looked at the moon, yeah, 500 million years from now, it'll look a lot different. And you can even see uh, sort of to the right and below another tiny, well, tiny, relatively tiny in this image, a smaller crater that looks even more recent than, than the Kepler crater. And so you've got the situation where you've got the, the background, the mare, and then you've got this impact that created the Kepler crater, and then something punched through that, uh, those rays and, and created more recent. And chances are, if you could get really close and look in that smaller crater, there'd be even more recent ones as well. And this is a way that, uh, that, that astronomers will date regions of the moon and regions of, of the other of the moons and objects in the solar system is they they count craters and they just say well there's a lot of craters here so it's so it's old and there's not a lot of craters in this region and so it's it's new that's right and 
you can also look at overlapping craters, and sometimes you get a big one, and there's a crater that hits it in the rim, and you can see that, oh, that, that other crater must have happened later. So I'm, I'm looking at this interesting little feature right here. Yeah, a walled plane. It's very circular here, and I can't quite draw the circle with my... It, that's clearly a big impact. <laughs> yeah. And it must, have, um, it must have been before that basin formed, and was a crater sitting there, and then the giant impact flooded it with uh, with lava, and and there are a lot of different names for these. And I was trying to think of it the other night, and I couldn't think of what it was. And then I was, I don't know, I was fooling around at home, and all of a sudden I went, oh, it's a walled plain. That's what it's called. That's the technical term. It's a crater that has been basically filled up. If you take a bowl and fill it with water, you get a flat bottom with a little rim around it, and that's what you're seeing there. And there's there's, uh, I'm seeing so many of them here. There's one to the lower right of that one. There's one to the left. Um, there's a bunch of them uh, on the upper right. You can see them. And you can see to the upper right there, to the right of Kepler, there's, uh, you can tell there's a, there must be another fresh crater over there. You can see rays coming out of it and a gigantic amount of mm. material. And it turns out that is the crater Copernicus. So can you go further to the right? Yeah, I'm, can you go... I'm east? right, left, reverse. So yeah. tell me if I go the wrong yeah, way. Can you east go on the moon, the west on the sky... Yeah. Look at how bright it is. It's so bright wow. it's, uh, it's overexposing his uh, computer chip. Can you step it down? Yes. Uh, let's see That's magnificent, though. Look at that. I know. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, a little too far. That's good. No, that's great. Look you at like that. You like that? Okay, all right, all right. It's Copernicus. Wait, this is great. When you get a... Um, when settle you get down, a big, settle down. I love this stuff. Are you I know, I know. Copernicus is huge. It's like it's 90 kilometers across, 60, 60 miles, 50, 50, 60 miles, something like that. So now you're talking about something that's getting to be the size of a state. It's huge. Wow. And um, when you get impacts that size, uh, the rim can be very complex. You can get multiple rings. You can have what are called terraced rims. The rim collapses as the shock wave blasts through this. I mean, you're talking about an impact that's leaving a crater that is 90 kilometers across. This is like the, uh, the combined yield of all the nuclear weapons on the planet is, is kind of what we're talking about here, even more. And so the, the physics of this is very difficult to understand. We don't understand it very well. But you can see it leaves a lot of chaotic stuff around it, and, and there's multiple uh, mountains in the center. The f you can see two of them, the two little fuzzy dots there in the center. Those are the central peaks uh, inside of this thing, and it's... Um, it's a mess. I mean, those things are huge. They're miles across. The fact that you can see them at all. And I've got it on my map. So that's got to be Reinhold. God, you can barely see it because the moon is almost full. And so these craters, um, the sun is shining straight down in these craters, and so there are no shadows. And it makes it really hard to tell um, what, you know, what you're seeing. When you look at that crater on the left, when you look at Kepler all the way there on the left, you can just see the uh, shadow of the rim in the crater floor. But over here, farther to the east, I guess, on the moon, the sun, sun's shining more straight down. There are no shadows. And so some of the craters in, my, in the picture I'm using as a map, which are really obvious to see in that picture, are not at all obvious here. It makes you uh, feel sorry for spies who are trying to <laughs> interpret spy satellite pictures. <laughs> it's upside down. And yeah, it's craziness. And angles, yeah. I thought about going into that business for a while after I, after I was working on Hubble for a while, and it's like, you know, I kind of understand this stuff, and then I thought, yeah, me, a spy. <laughs> yeah, and so this is... shut about anything. And this is one of the things that we talked about uh, about last night, was just how, uh, you know, the best time to see the moon is not when it's nearing full. This, we're closing in on one of the worst times to actually view the moon. It's, it's better to see the moon when it's only like at a quarter moon. And, and then you get these nice, big, long shadows and this really crisp Terminator line. Terminator line is where you've got the, the day side and the night side um, of, the, of the moon. And you get, you get these really nice, long shadows, and then you can really see everything in relief. And so you can, you're getting kind of a glimpse of it as, we're, as um, Mike is bringing that that left-hand side of the moon into, into view now, you can really see how the longer those shadows are, the more of the relief that we see. And so you would actually see that kind of shadowing across the whole moon when it's at a different, at a different phase. And uh, I think we've got a pile of questions, so let me see if we can kind of crank through some of these questions. Um, I recognize these craters. I've seen these before. Uh, so, okay, let me see. While Fraser's reading those, this, this big crater right on the Terminator, right smack on the center, 
of the uh, the image. That one right there. That's right. Thank you. That's Hevelius, and it's a hundred. It's over a hundred kilometers across, wow. sixty miles. It's it's enormous, and you can see again the bottom of it is filled in. It's smooth, and that's because it's uh, it's it's been filled in with uh, with lava. The one right above it is Cavalierius. I've got a map. I'm looking at. It's not like I have these memorized, but I do recognize them because I spent a lot of time at the eyepiece when I was younger. That's 60 kilometers across, so it's, you know, 35, 40 miles wide. Just a baby. So uh, Don uh, Denisiak uh, wanted to know if we can figure out what, the, if we could at some point explain the workarounds that we came through. Uh, we absolutely will once we've settled everything down. And, you know, right now I think the way we're doing everything changes every single night. So I wouldn't want to, you know, document it until we feel like we finally settled on the our our favorite solution. And I mean, we've been looking at, I mean, we've been calling uh, Mike's camera this kind of Frankenstein's monster. Although that's not the one you're using tonight. You're using a, a different no. one tonight. Yeah. Um, we we had Frankenstein connected to the uh, um, to the to the spotting scope, and it was literally, you know, it was uh, a web camera with crammed onto an, a Barlow, uh, like a, uh, an eyepiece, and then Velcroed together to the point that it was holding. And, and then <laughs> and that was it. And it was, you know, not pretty. Uh, yeah. So once we've come up with sort of a, be a best solution, and, and Mike's turned up some really great uh, cool adapters. So you can take a, they're about $20, and you can, it's got, like, it fits an eyepiece, but on the back side, you can screw in the, the innards of a webcam to hold it really, really still, and and then you can focus against that. But again, we're still experimenting. You know, if you guys enjoy what we're showing, then feel free to come along for the ride as we get the experiments going. And as I mentioned, Amit has got a different solution, and Sabine, who was doing this the other night, he's got a different solution. So, you know, hopefully we'll we'll settle on something you know really good, and then tell everyone to to get involved. Um, who did we lose? Oh, we lost, lost Phil. We lost, yeah. Oh, well. Oh, no. Boring Phil. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and then what was it? Um, so what kind of, so what, what's the camera again, Mike? Uh, it's, a, it's a Point Grey Research. Uh, is, that's the manufacturer, and the, the model number is a Flea 3. Right. And there's actually a few different Flea 3 models. This is the monochrome 640 by 480. And, but I think it's important that in many cases we've been using fairly old, you know, you've been using fairly old video technology stuff that you had kicking around. So, yeah. so this is definitely not the high-end best tools for the job. We're mostly trying to just get a sense of what it's going to take to make this all work. So, um, uh, yeah, someone mentioned that, that Pamela gave. Oh, so right. So there's a really cool extension that you can install that then turns this full screen. It's called Better Hangouts on Air, and you can just search for that in the Chrome store. Install that. You'll actually see Pamela Gay, my co-host on Astronomy Cast. She's in the uh, she's in the screenshots for this extension. And what it does is then once you have that installed, you can you get a little drop down that then expands the window to the width of your screen and a way to go full screen on it if you press F11 and it also allows you to um, to take the code and embed it on some other website so if you want to show people the live stream that we're doing you can you can do that um, it's pretty cool uh, now now uh, Mitchell Duke wanted us to look at Jupiter and we will try for sure the scene on Jupiter was not as nice as it is on the moon so we'll see about that um, yeah. Uh, so Matt Arnold wants to know if we can look at Mars, uh, and we can look at Mars in about six hours. So Mars right now is below the horizon and will be rising, uh, and same as Saturn. So if we all wanted to stick at this for about six hours, then we'd be able to see them. I'm not sure when they come above your horizon, Mike. Actually, but, I, I do think Mars has cleared the trees, but it's so hazy and, and murky, and low down towards the horizon, I don't, I don't think it would be much fun. Um, oh really? Yeah. Yeah, um, but if, you know, and you wait. And so one of the big problems with with this is that the the horizon. When you look at the horizon, you're looking through a lot more of the atmosphere, and so and so you get this atmospheric effect. And that's why you kind of often will see kind of a haze. Like if you ever notice, like when the moon rises, it rises really orangish, 
you know, very deep yellow, and then as the moon gets higher and higher, it turns this white color. And what's happening is you're seeing the moon through more of the atmosphere, and so it's a, it's much worse seeing. And but then when it gets really high up, then then you're seeing less atmosphere between you and the moon. And so for for the planets, if you're trying to look at say Mars or Mercury and things like that, it, it's quite um, awful. It's pretty terrible to see. So. Um, Let's see, and see what's any more questions. And then we can get back to, to looking at stuff. Yeah, Mitchell, yeah, no, the seeing is seems really good. All right. And yes, Wayne, we absolutely need some astronomers from the uh, the southern hemisphere. That would be that would be great. I mean again, I reiterate the big plan is multiple telescopes coming into this hangout at the same time. We can switch between the different views depending on what people are seeing. Because, you know, for someone who is in, say, Europe right now, they would have a beautiful view of Saturn. And we could contribute that to the view. Um, while a person who is in, uh, I'm trying to think, further, say a person in Hawaii right now would have a nice view of Venus. So. Just you know, the whole if, if we have the whole world to work with, we'll get a, a much better view of everything. That's really great, Mike. So, so how do you feel? Do you want to see if we can try and find Jupiter? Uh, let me see if I can still hit it from here. I think I can actually. Can and, you? Uh, might have a tree branch in the way, but we can give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> how is the the tracking on that? It was, it was pretty good on this scope, right? Yeah. Let's go back here. All right, so that's going to disappear for a minute, and then we'll be right back. <clears throat> and if this fails, we'll we'll come back to the moon. So you can hear the motor on his on his telescope. This is live. I'm back. Are you guys there? Yep, yep. We're uh, we're slewing to Jupiter. Okay. Yeah, I had a massive internet fail here. <laughs> I had to reboot my modem. We thought we had bored you. Yeah, I'm sick of this astronomy crap. <laughs> when when I was a teenager. I would sit at the edge of my driveway with my, uh, I had a 10-inch Newtonian in the middle of winter in northern Virginia. And look, <laughs> people say, oh, Virginia, it's the south. Like, yeah, when it's, when it's well below freezing and the wind is howling and I'd be out there observing. I <laughs> loved it. Well, this is the thing. It's a little warmer, I think, tonight for you, Mike, isn't it? Uh, it's probably down into the upper 40s now, but it was in the 50s for a while. Yeah, you had a pretty warm day today, but uh, last night he was freezing his buns off. Where are you? Central North Carolina. Oh, nice. Uh, uh, during the meteor shower, though, I think it was 18, and I did sit outside for a little while then, but <laughs> that was not much fun. I remember watching the Leonids, Ooh. oh, 10 years ago now? Oh, yeah? And that's, that's in November and freezing my butt off. It was so cool. <laughs> hey, look, there's a planet. There's something at the bottom there. Yep. I'm going to be rude and eat. I'm having a cookie. You have to share if you're eating sweets. Oh, man. If my wife's cookies are so good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is, um, this is without any magnification. So it's going to be a little teeny tiny here. And so just, just one thing to be really clear, um, we get, I get a, I've been getting a lot of people saying, have you heard about the Night Sky Network? Have you heard about the SLU telescope? Have you heard about the virtual, um, uh, the virtual telescope project from Bellatrix Observatory? Uh, absolutely. I've heard of all of these things, and I've reached out to everybody, and, and we're, please bring your telescope feeds and, and let me know because um, 
if you can get a telescope that is projecting a live feed into Google Plus Hangout, like what Mike is doing right now and what Sabine was doing and what Amit was doing and what John Boise can do, you know, if we can bring all those together, that's great. And But at the same time, you know, I think a lot of people have sort of dealt their own networks and they haven't really, you know, maybe they haven't heard or seen what we're doing. So if anyone has any pull with any of those people, absolutely. If We would be glad. We All comers are welcome to uh, to get into this live feed. And then we'll, you know, then hopefully then we can have multiple people and different people are going to have good seeing or bad seeing or different parts of the world or people can drop in and drop out. And hopefully then with a lot of redundancy with telescopes and people, then this thing will be unstoppable, right? <laughs> but right now it's, you know, it's all sort of, all on Mike's shoulders. So, so yeah. If anyone has any contacts with any of the people with the Night Sky Network or with the Ooh. virtual telescopes or any of that, we'd love to have those feeds as part of what we're doing. And if you're in this hangout, please plus one it. I just put that up on Twitter. That helps us know how many people are in here. And I just saw on my post, and and I'm going to mangle this pronunciation, but uh, Terja Shorjard, Terja, Ter, uh, I mean, let me see it written out. Terja Shorjard, I think. Is uh, he does time lapse, and I just posted one of his gorgeous time lapses on my blog the other day. He's one of those handful of guys who is making unbelievable night sky time lapses with the right. and the stars, and everything. And if he, if if you're in there, leave a comment in the uh, in the post. Love to hear from you because this is neat. I you know one of the great things about this right is that we can we can personally contact people, a and I email these guys who do time lapse photography, and and we we leave comments on each other's pictures and all that kind of stuff. But to actually be able to talk to them or, or to do it in real time, that's fantastic. That's a lot more human. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I saw something there, Mike. Yeah, I'm trying to up the magnification on this here. So we can oh, see. are you putting the, the Barlow on it again? Yeah. You want to take some questions then? Well, I did. So maybe people can, we can explain what a Barlow is because people don't kind of know what we're talking about. I'm sorry, say that again? What is a Barlow? You want me to answer that? Um, actually, okay, so hold on. So again, I know what it is. To, um, uh, yeah, no, I understand. So when we say we're going to pop the Barlow out and put in something else, what are we talking about? Well, um, the basic telescope that, that Mike's using here is called a Newtonian. It uses a mirror at one end that collects the light, focuses it onto a second mirror, which then bounces it into an eyepiece. That was a... B-17 bomber, wasn't it? Uh, B-2. Oh, B-2. There it is. I was yeah. going to say, wow. What are, you, what are you pointing your telescope at? Does yeah. the government know you're doing this? Um, <laughs> and so even a most basic telescope typically has um, more than one optical thing in it. There's, there's the mirror that reflects the light. There's a second mirror and then an eyepiece. But there are different kinds of eyepieces. And these are what are basically in charge of the magnification. And you can, you can have a, a wide field eyepiece, which has a bigger number. It might have a 25 millimeter focal length, which, which has to do with, with basically how wide of a field of view you're seeing, how much stuff you're seeing. The smaller the number, the more you're magnifying the image. Um, and sometimes that's not enough. And you can put in additional pieces of equipment to magnify the image even more. And a Barlow is basically a, it, it, it looks just like a barrel. It's usually, you know, I've got a cookie here. It's usually about this long, you know, a few inches long, and it's got a lens in it. And it can magnify the image even more, two or three times. Um, they're great if you want to look at something like Jupiter or the moon and see a lot of detail. Uh, but the trade-off, and there's always a trade-off in, in the universe. In this case, it's that uh, the magnification can be so high, it can be hard to focus, it can be hard to keep your, your uh, target centered because as the Earth is spinning, Jupiter is rising and you know, it's moving across the sky and you've got to have your telescope aimed precisely at it and moving with it. And that can be, you, you can usually do a pretty good job of that, but if it's off even a little bit under high magnification, your object's going to move right out. Um, and it also tends to um, make the object look a little fuzzier. You're magnifying the, the atmospheric turbulence and everything that's going on. And so it can really make the image look, uh, look a little junky. Um, but the, the advantage of that is if you have a steady atmosphere, if you can't keep it aimed, if you can't keep it focused, you get this gorgeous big picture. And, and Jupiter right now is, uh, see, North Carolina is two hours ahead. Yeah, so it's still up pretty high in the sky. I'm just trying to think of where it is in my sky and then making it two hours farther to the, <laughs> to the yeah, west. Yeah, well, I mean, when you dropped out, the thing that I was mentioning is that, like, right now, 
folks in Europe would have a view of Mars and and Saturn. In fact, if you're you know if you're in Europe right now and you've got clear skies, go on outside. You could probably see Mars and Saturn. Mm -hmm. um, and Jupiter's in, long set. <clears throat> and Jupiter's long set. Yeah. No. And and anybody in sort of North America right now is going to have a nice view of Jupiter and the Moon. And folks in Hawaii are going to be seeing uh, probably a nice bright Venus off to the off to the west. Right. And um, I'm trying to think what else we would be able to see. Everyone else has daytime, so. But the other thing that you know, because the planets are going are going around the sun, they're they're visible at different times of the year in different places. And so, you know, right now Jupiter is really bright in the sky, but it's only been that way for probably the last four or five months. Right, and won't be here for long. And Venus, um, which orbits inside of the Earth's orbit, it's actually closer to the Sun, moves so rapidly that uh, it's only it's usually only visible for a few months at a time. Right now, it's on the, it's on the far side of the Sun, and it's kind of coming around the side toward us, and uh, it's going to be, it's it's moving in between us and the Sun. And in fact, in June of this year, it's going to move directly in between us and the Sun, and we will see it from the Earth literally passing across the face of the sun, something that doesn't happen very often. But I um, actually have my squishy earth ball of science here. Wee, squishy <laughs> earth ball of science. And so it, it, right now, I have North America and South America there facing the camera. So if I were in North America and South America on this model, I would be seeing my camera. But my face is behind it. I'm actually seeing the other side. I'm seeing Asia and the Pacific Ocean, parts of Australia. So where you are on the earth will govern what part of the sky you can see. So if Jupiter is that way, then on this side of the Earth you can see it, but on the side I can see over here, you can't. And of course, if the sun is over here, if I, I have a light over here, I have a light up there and a light down here, but if this is the sun coming up this way, then anybody on this side of the Earth doesn't see anything at all because it's daytime. And over here it's nighttime because it's on the other side of the sun. So all, you know, all of this geometry, there's a, a lot of it going on. You have the, the Earth is spinning. It's going around the sun. The moon's going around the Earth. All the planets are going around the sun. It's like a gigantic clock. It really is like a gigantic clock. And, and once you can picture that in your head and see how all this stuff works, it's magnificent. It's really wonderful to be able to ply your way around the solar system inside of your own head. It's a pretty cool trip to take. Well, it's interesting to think about the different kinds of sky objects and whether or not everyone gets a chance to see them and whether or not only certain parts of the Earth get to see them, right? right? I mean, you know, for example, with Jupiter, everyone on Earth gets its turn to see Jupiter. Right. It's, it's just, you know, everyone at approximately 7 o'clock at night will see Jupiter, you know, rising in, the, rising in the east and making its way across the sky. Everyone will see Venus at your, you know, just after sunset, you'll see Venus right now. But other things, like for example, um, a like like a lunar eclipse, right? Like a lunar eclipse is only going to happen for four or five hours, and so it's only the part of the Earth that has the dark is in the darkness at that point is going to be able to see the lunar eclipse, and it's even smaller for people, you know, hoping to see a solar eclipse. Um, and meteor showers, for example, are tend to be visible for everyone on the whole planet, but if it all just depends on, the, again, the geometry, you know, one part of the Earth is kind of splatting into the trail of, of the comet that is, that is leaving the meteorites. And so, you know, wherever that peak happens to hit... Meteors, the Earth, meteors not meteorites. Yeah, then we're the meteors. So whatever <laughs> to jump all over whichever there. part of the Earth is, is smacking... Yeah, no. Whichever part of the Earth is smacking into the, uh, into the stream at the peak... They get the best view of the of the meteor shower. Yeah, sorry, I apologize. Meteors are the things that go through the sky, and meteorites are what they are when they've already hit the ground. I right. know that. <laughs> the way I like to describe I look it forward for a meteor to your shower. Email. Um, for a meteor shower, the way I like to describe it is if you imagine you're you're driving in a car, and you drive through a cloud of gnats, a cloud of bugs, or something. And, you know, where do they all hit? They all hit on the front side of the car, the windshield. And the back side of it, you don't see that many. And it's the same thing for the Earth. As the Earth is moving through space, as it's orbiting the sun, the, these, you're passing through the tail of a comet, which I don't really have a good uh, prop for here. But basically, as the Earth is moving through space, this side of the Earth is going to smack into those meteors, and the side on the other side of the Earth isn't. 
So the, the part facing into the stream is where you're going to see those meteors. And so as the Earth is spinning, if, if, if you're passing through a big, wide cloud of, of, of these things, everybody gets their chance. But it tends to happen at a certain time of night for everybody, just at your local time. Ooh, look at that. There we go. We're getting there. Is it um, not circular, or is that just me? It, is it vignetting? Is it near the edge of the eyepiece? Uh, no. Uh, it just looks like the aspect ratio of the software might be messing up here. I'm not sure. Yeah, you can see the belts are upper left to lower right, and that's where Jupiter should be widest, not skinniest. Yeah. Um, Boy, your tracking is good. Uh, Alex Cole asked, he said, I realize this is in its infancy, but eventually looking at the moon of the planets will get old. Uh, is there a webcam sensitive to pick up and stream DSOs without long exposures? Uh, yeah, so that's the long-term plan, is that the way astrophotography works is that you get a really precise tracking on an object, like a nebula or a galaxy, and then you open up the exposure and you you set your exposure time for about, say, 30 seconds, and you collect all that, and then you update the the sort of the view. And so the plan is that we're going to be able to sort of experiment with this and start, you know, doing longer exposures. And so it'd be it'd be kind of like you're playing a video game at a lower fl at a lower frame rate, right? So we'll gather a lot more photons, update the view, gather a lot more photons, update the view. And so if if that works out pretty well, then we will be able to get more deep sky objects and so we should have that collection, right? We're going to have some collections of some planets and then maybe some stuff that, that, that's focused on more deep sky objects and we're just going to wait for it to get a nice updated view so that we can see something a little more, a little more crisp and a little more detailed. Because, because as, uh, as uh, Alex is saying, <clears throat> to see the more fainter objects, the galaxies, the nebula, that kind of thing, it does, you, you don't see it in real time in the same way that we would with the, the brighter objects like the, the planets and the moon. But if that's, you know, you can follow our journey or you can wait and come back in a year when we've got it all figured out. <laughs> Your refund is in the mail. Um. <laughs> uh, there's definitely some potential with this camera to get uh, globular clusters especially. Maybe some of the brighter planetary nebula like um, the Ring Nebula and, and those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, I think Jupiter is probably dipping below 30 degrees here now. It's pretty ugly looking, and my mirror is probably not very cold either. Let's see how close I am. Yeah, it's still about three degrees warmer than the ambient temperature. The ambient temperature's dipped to 46 here, and the mirror's at 49. And so you can see with a telescope this big, well, we can see a bit of a few of the bands here, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah. But with the with the telescope, the the temperature of the mirror matters a lot, and the temperature of the outside sky matters a lot, and where the the planet is really matters a lot too. It's pretty blurry, and you've also you've also got some light clouds. I mean, this yeah. last night I think we had much better seeing. It was a lot more crisp and clear with a with a smaller telescope. Yeah. Yeah, so that goes to show, night over night, the great equalizer is the atmosphere. Right, it's it's turbulent. It's like looking through boiling water. Yeah. And it, it distorts the light coming in from the planets and stars. And the the problem is, uh, when, it's, when the atmosphere is more unstable, it makes things look worse. And uh, it happens on sort of a what I was going to say, a spatial scale. In other words, usually it's very small compared to the size of, say, something like Jupiter. But, it, but in, in fact, it can blur things out uh, on a scale even as big as Jupiter. And it looks like it's, you know, we're, we're getting, uh, it's fuzzing out things that are smaller. We can see, you can see two of the bands there across mm. Jupiter's face. But what's funny is, when the, when the atmosphere is unstable, it's, it's actually better to use a smaller telescope. Because a big one, you're just magnifying yeah. all of that mess. And do it you makes, your, try, makes, your, makes your view worse. Do you want to try popping out the Barlow? Uh, yeah, we can do that. I think it's going to look much worse. You think so? Well, it's going to get smaller. Yeah, but it's, well, this is pretty blurry anyway. Yeah. It, it might be easier to focus it. Um, so Nicole Guglielucci, the noisy astronomer, 
um, was in our uh, our Thursday weekly roundup. If you if anybody out there was watching that, and she's an old friend. She's in she was in Boulder uh, actually. We were we were chatting last night. She's she's getting her PhD at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, and that's where I went to get my PhD. And back in 1994, when uh, Shoemaker Levy Nine Comet broke into pieces and slammed into Jupiter over and over again. Go look up Shoemaker Levy 9. Yeah, I think it was 97. It was, 90, it was 94, wasn't it? Was it 94? Okay. It couldn't have been 97. I was long gone by then. All right. Um, I was gainfully employed at that point. But uh, uh, back then, um, at, at the university, there is an observatory right off campus. It's a 26-inch telescope. Now, it's a 26-inch lens. This is a huge lens. The 100, 100 years old was built in 1885, and it's a magnificent telescope. It was 110 years old and still really easy to use. Ooh, watch this as he's focusing the image. That is so cool. <laughs> but I, I, went to look at the, uh, I went to look at Jupiter. Oh, oh, oh yeah. yeah. You can see the moons there. Yeah. Okay, let me... Um, you thought I was crazy. I see three moons. I see three as well. I'm pulling up some software to see if I can find out what those are. But just to finish my story, I was using the 26-inch to look at Jupiter. And... Um, I couldn't see anything. It, the atmosphere was too unsteady. So I went out to the back, and there was a six-inch telescope, a much smaller lens. And boom, I could see the impact sites on Jupiter clear as day, little black spots on it. It was incredible. And it well, goes to show you that you sometimes don't want to have a, a big telescope. Bigger's not always better. I think this looks better. Oh, look at that. That's much better. Yeah. The aspect ratio looks better, too. Yeah. Jupiter is, in fact, oblate. It's not a perfect sphere. It's spinning so rapidly, about once every 10 hours, and it's so huge that the centrifugal force basically s blows it out at the equator. So it's actually flatter at the poles than it is at the equator. What you're seeing there, I think, is real. So, Mike, I'm not sure if you know, you've got a help window in the bottom left-hand corner of the view and a uh, blue stripe over on the right-hand side. I don't mean to be a perfectionist. That's okay. I, I actually didn't even see that. Is that is it cleared now? They, they, you got the window out, but you still got that blue stripe over on the right, and it's you know taking away the black majesty of the uh, of the <laughs> night sky with the great well, blue wall. Be low for you. I'm not sure where. Here we go. Ah. There you go. You're moving it. You're going and nope. gone. Oh. Uh. So so now this is kind of funny because of the way this camera works. It's not funny. It's kind of. It's unfortunate. Um, the way this camera works, we can't both get the exposure settings of Jupiter and its moons at the same time. So if you see, as, as Mike kind of changes the exposure setting of Jupiter, then you get to see the moons. And so you can see, there's two moons over on the left-hand side, and there's one moon on the right-hand side. And I think I saw another moon even further to yeah. the right. There's one to the right. I actually have those. I don't know if anybody can see this. Let me put this up here, and I'll let's see. I'll rotate it to get it about right. Eh, wait a minute. I love I love this that I can just pull out some software <laughs> and do this. This is so cool. And maybe it's reverse. This is correct for me. Maybe I've got it backwards. Yeah, you do. I think you. I think you're gonna have it backwards. I think it's, it's that like way. This, then. Yeah. So you got Jupiter there on the right. Those two moons. The one on the left is Ganymede, which is the largest moon in the solar system. It's bigger than the planet Mercury, and it's bigger than, just slightly bigger than Saturn's moon Titan. Right next to it is Io, which is um, very close to the size of, of Earth's moon, and it is volcanic. It was the first object other than the Earth to seem to have active uh, uh, tectonics going on, active uh, uh, volcanism. <coughs> this next one that we're seeing here right in the center, that's Europa. That is the one that's covered in ice. It was featured in the movie 2010. Uh, and uh, it's, it's one of the primary targets for astrobiology because we think there's liquid water under the surface. It may have life. And the one on the right is Callisto, um, which is cool on its own. I don't know that much about it, but it's, uh, it's another one of these battered, uh, heavily cratered objects. Well, it's another moon that's thought to have potentially have liquid water uh, underneath the ice, so it's sort of a, it's the halfway point in between Ganymede, which is quite solid, and Europa, which is thought to have these, these oceans underneath the ice. You know, if I didn't know better, I'd swear Ganymede looks bigger than Io. It may just be that it's brighter. Um, 
Uh, oh, and uh, sorry, uh, Will Hughes wanted to know if we could get a streaming scope on the sun, uh, seeing it through different filters would be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, one of the astronomers I was working with today had the sun, and we were playing around with it, but, you know, his horrible eyepiece contraption was even more, you know, janky than uh, than what uh, Mike has put together, and so we just didn't kind of feel like it was ready to go. But, uh, but yeah, no, we were, you know, nice big disc of the sun and sunspots, and so, again, you know, we could have a bunch of people with the night sky and then even the person viewing the sun at the same time as well because, it, you know, the Earth is round. So I was going to highlight which moon was which here. I'm I'm backwards left right here, which is yeah. actually annoying. <clears throat> so which one was which? Here? Is that one? And then these two over here. And I'm tweeting it here. Okay. <clears throat> I think that's the right link. I was also inviting somebody to come into the hangout, make sure he sees it, because I know he'll get a kick out of it. Um, yeah. So there you go. And so then, so then, can we go back to actually seeing the, the bands across the planet? Yep. Oh, that was easy. Yeah. So normally, through a small telescope, even through binoculars, and this, this amazes me too, if you just have a pair of binoculars and you go out and look at Jupiter, you can see it as a tiny little disk, and uh, you can see that there are stripes going across it. Uh, Galileo's telescope, where he discovered these, these features, was tiny, tiny, tiny. It wasn't very big. And modern binoculars, uh, you know, the optics are just as good as what he had, if not better. So you can see this, and these are bands of material, basically storms that are all the, that are all the way across the planet itself. And uh, there are two dark zones. The dark ones are zones, right? And the bright ones are bands. Yes. Yes. And one of them, the northern equatorial zone. Dang it, now I think I'm saying that wrong. No, the brown ones are belts. That's how I remember it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Because yeah, the northern equatorial belt, it was the NEB, yeah. uh, disappeared. Poof. Gone. Almost overnight. Uh, about a year or two ago, I think it was. And that happened sometimes. I remember it happened when I was in grad school and everybody was, nobody had ever seen this before. I don't think it had been really ever seen before. And it's because Jupiter has weather. It's a big ball of gas. And um, these, th this these clouds can change temperature. They can warm up and rise up, and they can get cold and sink. And if they sink, other stuff flows over them, and then you can't see them anymore. And that's what happened in the northern equatorial belt. It was gone for like a year, and now it's uh, it's starting. To, it's been coming back for a while, but it's still not as strong as the southern belt, which you, which you can see much more brightly. The southern end of Jupiter is up in the screen here, and I don't know if the red spots on this side of the planet. I think we saw it earlier, briefly, and then um, yeah. I'm sure it's rotated out because we struggled with some things for a little while. Well, it's, yeah, it only takes a few hours to completely rotate, so it's the fastest uh, rotating planet in the whole solar system and also the largest. I need to... Which is why it, it has this squashed appearance. It's actually spinning itself so quickly that it flattens out. Yeah, this software. I, God, when I was in grad school and I had to look for I had to look for stuff in the sky. I was looking at objects. I had to go into the library. I had to pull out photographic plates. I had to Xerox them. I had to look stuff up. It was a pain in the butt. Now I've got an iPad, and I say, Oh, let me look at Jupiter, and I'll center it here. And oh yeah, two hours ago the red spot was on this side of the planet, but now it's rotated off. It's it's off right. the side now, so we can't see it. It's that simple. I love this. <laughs> it's the future. Which which software program are you using, Phil? Oh, which one is this? Is Sky Safari? It was the one that was being promoted by Astronomers Without Borders right before uh, the end of the year. Okay. So I picked it up for my. Uh, I, I I resisted buying an iPad forever, and then um, my wife got me one for my birthday, and it's it it's awesome. I thought it was it's stupid. It's a big giant iPhone that you can't make yeah. phone calls on. <laughs> it turns out it's a big giant iPhone you can't make phone calls on that you can do really cool stuff on. Yeah, I know our our iPhones are are never dropped. Was that the Lynx uh, constellation? Yes, it's uh, <laughs> my, my Ubuntu version there. <laughs> yeah, there is a the, constellation uh, Lynx, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah all of the uh, Linux uh, 
aficionados will be glad to know that it's uh, you're running Ubuntu here. Yes. Which has both been good and bad. Yes. I did have to reboot, I will admit. <laughs> well, it's getting a little uh, a little fainter, a little dimmer, so I think we're going to lose Jupiter. But All I would right. say this is, you know, if you had a good night seeing, this is the kind of view of Jupiter you'll see in about a six-inch telescope with your eyeballs. Yep. That'd I would say. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, there are much better views that can be gotten from this telescope, for sure. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you've seen much better views of it. Yes. There's uh, several factors at odds against me. And one of them is Jupiter sinking down. It's almost, Jesus, I think it's almost above the trees right now. Yeah, yeah it's got to be pretty low. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and unfortunately, Mars is almost on the exact same height on the opposite side of the sky, so I'm not even going to try that. Well, can you even just, like, like I know it's, like, no one's watching. So, <laughs> so I mean, could you even just try and get a blurry red spot in the telescope, or will that just make you sad? Uh, it'll make me sad, but I'll do it. I'll do it just for you. Thanks. Mars, Mars isn't that interesting. I mean, it's, it's definitely not. I mean, it's you know, if you're really lucky, you're going to see the the polar ice caps. And sometimes, even, um, on a decent night with my 10-inch scope, I could pretty easily spot Sirtis Major, which is a big dark region um, in the center of Mars, but that's really it. Um, and I remember when um, there was a really good uh, uh, opposition of Mars. Mars's orbit is, is highly elliptical. And so uh, you can imagine two cars going around a racetrack at different speeds, and on occasion they'll pass each other. But if you can imagine that the, that the two tracks are sort of off-center, there are times when you'll pass closer than other times. And uh, Mars sometimes, uh, when we pass it, uh, is is closer than other times. And uh, years ago, there was a, a particularly good time when it was close. And I remember going to a star party, and there were just there were hundreds of people there. They're all clamoring to see Mars. And I thought, yeah, they're not going to be happy. And sure enough, I mean, Mars is so small. It's it's only a third of the size of the Earth. And even at its closest, you know, it's still 20-something or 30-something million miles away. So um, even though it's much closer than Jupiter is, uh, it's so tiny that you need a, a pretty big telescope to get a good view of it. And we're kind of spoiled by our spacecraft going there yeah. and taking these gorgeous pictures. Yeah. But, it, you know, during that really close time, that really close approach of, of Mars back in 2003, it was, you know, there was no question where Mars was. It was big and bright and really shining in the sky. And uh, and even in a lot of fairly small telescopes, you got a really nice view of it. But it's one of these things, you pretty much got to wait two years to see a really good view of Mars. And I don't think we're near well, opposition right it's now. It's been swallowed up by the clouds by the time the telescope moved to the other side of the sky here. Ah, uh, all right. Uh, I can't even see it with my eyes. Oh. Where, what, um, what direction is clear? The moon. We can go back to the moon. Yeah, I think we can wrap up with the moon. Um, yeah, I think with a black and white camera. I'm just thinking about what's in that area. Well, we tried the trapezium last night. Yeah, you're not gonna not with the moon being full. You're not gonna see any nebulosity, even with a 14 inch. You might, but it's not gonna be very impressive. Yeah. I was thinking there's um. We can do Pleiades. M35. Oh wow. Uh, where? Why the Pleiades? Yeah, the Pleiades. The Pleiades would look nice, although we're any, magnifying the image so much. Yeah. Are there any globular clusters in the in the region? Probably. Yeah, what's Gemini? I got a good shot of Gemini. Is there anything in there? M35 is near the near the feet. That was always one of my favorites. It's easy yeah. to find. Yeah. But I don't know if a cluster. Hello. What's that? The moon? That's that's the moon. Yeah. Wow. Through your that's telescope? A, yeah. That's actually so there. Cameras here. This is the finder scope. Oh. Oh, you switched to switch the finder scope. Uh, Wait, no. Let's see that. That's cool. Yeah. Well, this was this was the plan, right? Was we had the two yeah. telescopes. There's the finder scope on on beside the telescope, and then there's the main telescope. And so the hope was that we could get two feeds, one with the sort of wide view, and then one with the more narrow view. But again, this is uh, this is all in process. Now, you had no confidence I could get a FireWire camera in here. 
and you give me a little <laughs> more time and a couple more practice sessions, and I can I, do that. I believe I, I I was skeptical that it would happen quickly and easily. I believe is what I described <laughs> it. And you that said, you no, were right about. You said no problem, and I just you know, okay. Um, uh, right, so Matt Arnold wants to know, Phil Play, any plans of getting your buddy Neil deGrasse Tyson on one of these hangouts for a discussion in the future? And let's give the standard answer that we give when anyone asks us, where is Neil deGrasse Tyson? He's such a prima donna. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, he's not on Google+. Plus. That's right. That's it. That is it. And, you know, uh, he's not on Twitter that much. No, he's on he's Twitter. He's a busy guy. He's all on Twitter. He's all over Twitter. He's he's on Twitter. He doesn't he doesn't post a huge amount on Twitter. No, a couple but of times a week he sends out a yeah, sort of little piece. Around. Yeah, a pretty great tweet that gets heavily retweeted. But you know, I mean, we're uh, we're the people who are available right now. And uh, I was say, no, we're the people's astronomers. We're the people's astronomers. <laughs> no, if, if you know, I mean, if Neil deGrasse, Neil deGrasse Tyson had time and got himself to Google Plus and got his webcam set up and and wanted to participate in this kind of stuff, he'd be welcome. It'd be great. It'd be fun. I, I, I fully plan on asking him. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see. We're just, I, I think at, um, hey, whoa, that. that's cool. I that think we fine, have to, right? you know, get this all solidified and, and streamlined a little bit. Yeah. And then we'll, and then we'll you know, I, I suspect he would enjoy something like this. I know he enjoys star parties and that kind of thing. Yeah. And part of it is we just don't want to waste his time, you know. I mean, yeah. you normally we wouldn't even show you people this stuff, right? But you know, there's a certain point where we got some beautiful views of the moon, and we just thought, okay, let's just let everyone see the broadcast. But but you know, we want to make the whole thing a lot smoother and slicker, and you know, we don't want to waste his time. Hey, I just saw on Twitter a friend of mine, Bob Goodman, who is a writer for Warehouse 13. If anybody watches that show, was watching earlier. He said. He just left me a note. That's pretty cool. It's. It, I love how you can get access to so many people doing so many different things. Is this the trapezium? Yes. Okay. And you can see that there's some nebula around there, too. I just can't quite get yeah. the focus here. Yeah, the focus is a little off. So, I can... Uh, we had the four stars of the trapezium pretty clean last night. Yeah, but that... Yeah, I so saw that... that. It came in, or I saw it on the on the web on the uh, YouTube video later. Yeah. What you actually see there—that's the actual Orion Nebula around it. Because this is a sensitive camera. The other one was just showing you noise. Yeah. Okay. So right. So there's the trapezium. Oh yeah. Look, there's the fish mouth. Yeah. 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 So if you can bring it, can you get it in better view there? Yeah. I, don't, I, gotta, I don't know what happened to my focus here. Why not? I, I can. Um, I can bring up a picture. Uh oh. You, my pretty. Oh. So what we're going to be looking at here is the Orion Nebula. There we go. Which is one of the most celebrated objects in the sky. What you're, what it is, is if you go outside and look at Orion, and you look below his belt, and there are three stars hanging there, and that there's that's supposed to be his dagger. And my my roommate in school used to always go, yeah. His dagger and uh, the middle star. I'll just leave that leave that out there for you guys. The middle star in that dagger is not actually a star. It's a gigantic gas cloud. It's one of the biggest gas and dust clouds in the in the Milky Way galaxy. It's called the Orion Nebula. It has a host of other names. And there are stars actively forming in the center of that cloud that are lighting it up. And there are four very massive uh, stars. They each have um, easily uh, 10 to 15 times the mass of the sun, if not more. And stars that massive are extremely hot, extremely bright, blasting out ultraviolet light, and that lights up the gas around them. And these four stars form sort of a trapezoid, and they're called the trapezium. They're really easy to spot. Even with binoculars, you can see them with, um, with, a, with a bigger telescope. They're, they're easily separated. And then you can see all of the nebulosity around it. A nebula means cloud in Latin, so that's, that's what that is. And, I, and, and once I show you a picture, you'll probably recognize it because it's, uh, like I said, it's a celebrated object. You see it everywhere. The Hubble, the Hubble pictures of it are phenomenal. But it, it, it's so close and so bright. Oh, that's a good one right there. There we go. There we go. Oh, sweet. Very oh, nice. That's it. So there's a trapezium in the middle. 
All four of those stars are incredibly massive. They will one day explode. They will become supernovae. Each one of those will detonate with as much energy, give off as much energy as all the rest of the stars in our galaxy combined. Wow. Um, and you can see the gas around it there, it's shaped like that. If I can, I can probably you can see this. I mean, you can see this region with the unaided eye. And so when you look at Orion and you see Orion's belt, you see this thing. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh man, I was totally wrong. Look you at that. Completely when see the seeing that. is bad, this is what you got to have a Newtonian for that's fast so you can go to deep sky. Okay, if you look so at my feed, uh, it's reflecting. Oh, there we go. That's what we're seeing. This no, is a picture no. from a big telescope showing that nebulosity. And you can see that sort of uh, crescent shaped dark region next to the bright trapezium. I can't get I that exposed correctly. You are getting this view, Mike. <laughs> that's phenomenal. That is so beautiful. Look at all those. Almost all of those stars that you're seeing are associated with that cloud, are, are young, uh, very bright stars. At this distance, the sun would be incredibly faint. Yeah, so this, this is 1,500 light years away. And you look at, look at the, um, the belt of Orion, and then there's this, it's called the scabbard hanging down. That's kind of the region that we're looking at right now. And this is unbelievable. Bill's talking about this area right here. That's called the fish mouth. It's a dark... Yeah region that's blocking the, it's either it's, um, it's a dark cloud blocking the stuff behind it or it's just where there's no material. I assume it's stuff that's blocking material behind it. That, when I was growing up, um, I, was, I, I stammer because I'm thinking of a lot of things. Shut up. No, I, can't, I cannot believe how good this looks. This, yeah, this is, is amazing. Way, this is way beyond. So, I mean... Uh, you know, I mean, I'm looking at a picture. Alex asked you before. I uh, I take it all back. We're done. We've arrived. This is it. <laughs> With this telescope. You know, I'm I'm looking at a picture that was taken by an enormous ground-based telescope, and I'm seeing the same features. I I can see the same stars. I can trace it down. It's very cool. And you know, when I was growing up, uh, we thought at least what what I thought was that this was just a big diffuse cloud of gas in in space, but it's not. This is actually only the illuminated portion of a much larger cloud that's dark and extremely dense. It's so thick, uh, it's like a huge, it's like a, a fog, that stars in there are completely shrouded. We don't see them at all in visible light. But near the edge of this gigantic cloud, these bright stars formed, and they started blasting out all this light, and they have fierce winds, like a solar wind, but on steroids. And they have basically blown out the side of this cloud. And so you can imagine, it's like a Death Star. It's like a cloud with a, with a cavity out of the side of it. And that's where these stars are sitting, and they're illuminating all of that material around it. So we're just seeing some of the thinner stuff, uh, the, the remnants of this, this, uh, this rupture out of this deeper cloud. And it's, it's incredible to think about this. The scale of this is enormous. You're looking at a, at a, at a blowout that's light years across, trillions of miles across. And it's, it's all been scooped out by, you know, a handful of stars. But these are superstars with, with, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of times the brightness of the sun. And, and, uh, and you're looking at it live through a telescope yeah, in North Carolina. Live. Yeah. And what's interesting is, is that this oh. is, it's thought that our, you know, our Earth and Sun formed in a nebula like this. And there's different nebula that you can look at. There's, there's this, which is sort of this you know, this nursery of stars that, that we might, we, uh, you know, that the sun might have come from a place like this. But then you, as you look out into the sky, you can see other examples of older scenarios. You can see the, the Hyades cluster. You can see the, you know, Pleiades. And they're at different ages. And so we can kind of trace back and see what something like the Orion Nebula will evolve into over time as more of these stars grow up. They detonate. They seed the region with heavier elements. They sort of blow away this, this nebulosity that's in between and kind of clear out the space. And where we are now with our sun, we don't even know where the stars that we formed with are that's right. And so, um, oh, hello. Just Warp speed. Poking yeah. around, seeing what I can find. This is actually a lot bigger nebula than what you can see in this focal thing. The, the, the entire illuminated portion of this nebula is about the same size in the sky as the full moon. And now, mind you, you know, the moon is only uh, 250,000 light years, 250,000 miles away, pardon me. 
and and this nebula is trillions of miles away. It's it's actually it's actually tens of quadrillions of miles away. It's really far away. So it's huge. So you can see this line right in here. Hey. <laughs> to our hangout, welcome. Dang it, you guys, I want to go to bed sometime. <laughs> Pamela <laughs> Gay's here, everybody. So, so, hey. so, so you, I don't know if you've been watching Pamela, but uh, we were, we sort of moved to uh, the trapezium, and look at the nebulosity there. Do you believe this, Pamela? That, that's absolutely amazing. That, that's that's so stunning. Cool. I, I just got here. I have to admit, I made the mistake of going and eating dinner, which is always a horrible thing to do when there might be a hangout. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's always might going to be a hangout with us now, I think. Well, that, that's true. That's true. Hey, You're going to you make want, it impossible to eat, which is a great diet plan. More hangouts. That's the way to lose weight. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Keith, Keith Cowing noted, uh, interesting concept. Seriously, but all I see is video that looks like the traffic webcam for the Dulles Toll Road. Um, I don't know if you saw, we had uh, the moon earlier, and, uh, and that looked pretty clear. So it depends. If you really like the moon and planetary stuff, that's one way to go, and if you want to try and go after some of the deeper sky objects that a lot of people do, then, then that's good. And, you know, in our point of view, it's important to uh, share our love of astronomy with people. But do, do you want to hear Mike scream in pain? Well, and this, this is... <laughs> uh, Mike, do you, do you have an O3 filter? <laughs> is he there, Mike? Did we lose him? No, I don't know. One way we could, I mean, this picture is amazing, but it, it, it's possible it could get even better. There are filters that let through just the light from um, uh, 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 oxygen atoms, which, which this nebula is loaded with. And so it, all, the, all the glow from the moon that's lighting up the sky would go away, and it would, it would sort of bring out the contrast. We'd see the nebula even better. But you'd have to pull the eyepiece out in the camera and da-da-da. So I was just kidding about getting those filters. But I, I'm, sure he, I'm sure he has one. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, sometimes you can also get lucky, and the way they set up systems like this is you have a filter wheel, and you just rotate the wheel and what's in front of the camera. So you have an entire wheel, and the camera only looks at one spot on the wheel. So as you rotate the camera, you can get different filters into the image and change exactly what you're able to see. You know, uh, I That's stepped true. away for a second, Phil, but I actually do, uh, I did remember that this filter that we're looking through right now is actually red. Um, I, I, I don't have any filter? narrow band filters, but I can change this to, and I just changed the focus depth. Is that a, that's a wide band red, or was it an H alpha? It's a it's a wide band. Yeah. Okay. But, oh you man, know, Now now I'm now I'm curious to see. I got deep sky objects. So maybe I'll. So can <laughs> this we try is major like a, geeky stuff now? Yeah, yeah. Now we're all geeky though. Can can we try like a cluster? Uh, yeah. Well, let's, let's let him try the nebular one? filter here. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I'm trying to remember what clusters are up right now. What's the Owl Nebula? M35 is our best bet, I think. Okay, we can try that one. Let's yeah, I want to hit this there, one though. in the clear filter first before we leave it, because the red is going to limit what we can see, and it's already fairly bright here. Let's get the focus. There we go. Okay. Oh, and one of the frustrations is focus actually changes with filter. Yeah. Oh, look at that. So there you go. That's now he's changed the contrast. So that's the trapezium there at the lower left. I Let's believe that bright star is the is called Theta One C. I've written about that one before. It's a it's a bruiser. It's a massive, massive star. When it blows up, yowza! It's going to be bright. Um, and uh, Keith, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll probably wrap up on the moon. And like I said, the view of the moon that we had. This is a 14-inch telescope, and we had it zoomed right in on some really nice craters. It's uh, it's quite beautiful. So. Um, I recommend, well, like, hopefully if Mike can, we can end up on the moon again once we've tried a few more deep sky objects. So do you have this, uh, basically, do you have an a eyepiece and then this feeds off of the eyepiece? Uh, or no. is this going straight yeah, into the eyepiece holder? No, one of the challenges we had was to take this camera, which is a Firewire camera, and get it to work with the Google Hangouts. So what we're actually looking at is a desktop share of the live view, and so I can use my mouse cursor here to point things out. And right, right, right. But you have a camera attached to your telescope somehow. Is it attached yeah. into the eyepiece holder, or yeah. is it eyepiece projecting into the camera? There, there's no eyepiece. It's the okay. uh, camera with no lens plugged directly into the filter wheel. 
Okay. All right, so, so find us another deep sky object, Phil. What do you recommend? Well, I like M35, but it's really close to the moon. So I might suggest M41, which is a cluster in Canis Major. But I don't know how high up off the, off the horizon that's going to be for him. Yeah, yeah. no, I, this is about as low as I can go. Here, i got trees directly to yeah. the west. Yeah. M41 is a nice comments make a recommendation? I saw a few recommendations back So there. what Let's about see. the double cluster in Perseus, maybe? Mm, uh, I think that's Is it too big, maybe? To that might be too big. OK. Well, Let's try there's Andromeda, first. but it's getting pretty low. Yeah, yeah. Um, so M38, M36, M37 in Aru in, uh, in Ariga. Ariga. Those are pretty close to the moon as well. Yeah. Those I love those. Those are all they're all three in a line uh, next to the bright star Capella, <laughs> which is this big yellow giant, and uh, that's that was always one of my favorites with binoculars when I was in high school, because um, I was a dork. Uh, Keith, uh, I love the random than Bobcat. <laughs> Thank you. We can do two <laughs> image screens. Absolutely, that's the plan. Is we're going to do multiple telescopes oh. all showing at the same time. So Damn. yeah, absolutely. We've got we've got big plans. We can have a a day time view with someone showing um, the sun, we can have somebody pointing at the moon, somebody at a planet, someone doing some deep sky stuff, and then we could even be injecting animations and, you know, and, and photographs. And, and you know, one of my... Holding my iPad up. Yeah, yeah and, and Phil <laughs> holding his iPad up. Right? Yeah. So we're just letting people in on the experiment while we do it, because, I don't know, because and, we're crazy. Where are the people's astronomers? <laughs> Oh. One, one of my fantasies is one of my fantasies, other than to not have as bad a lag as I have right now because I'm in a hotel room, um, one, one of my fantasies is to get also one of the telescopes doing variable stars so that over the course of looking at all sorts of pretty things, we can keep going back to a variable star and see how stars actually do change in brightness. And one of, one of the things I quote a lot is Keats said he wanted to love as quote as, as uh, love as constant as the stars, but stars do things like explode, and that's not a love affair I want to have. And um, <laughs> it's, it's just amazing how many people don't realize that stars vary in brightness. And with technology like this, we can actually sit through watching a binary star where one eclipses the other, or watch a pulsating variable where the stars grow and change in color and then shrink and change in color again. I mean, the thing that I would, I, I think would be nicest would be some kind of globular cluster, but Hercules yeah. is down. Let's try M35. I was actually going to see, um, I binned it. This is a 2x2 two two bin, which is why you can see part of the background behind the, the live window now. And uh, you, I can get the exposure a little higher, too, so it's a little, little bit more rich. And yeah. you can actually see some of the faint wisps in the arms out, out in here, which I thought was kind of cool. Yeah, there are a lot of tricks you can do to improve an image depending on what you're seeing and what you want to see. And one thing you can do is you can imagine a, uh, uh, a camera detector like this, a digital detector, just like the one in your phone and in the camera you have, is basically a grid of pixels that are sensitive to light. And if you're trying to look at something really faint, then you can think of, you can think of these things as like a, a series of buckets, a grid of buckets in a rainstorm, and they're collecting rain. And each one might only collect a few drops, but if you can add, like, say, four buckets together in a two-by-two two grid and then go over to the next four and add those together and go over to the next four. So that's what he's saying. He's two-by-two two binning. He's taking all the light from four pixels and adding them up into one. So he's shrinking these, the, the size, the field of view that he's seeing is shrinking by a factor of two in each but, direction. But, Mike, okay. I'm not sure you're aware, but we're seeing the links, we're seeing the links image again. We're that's because yeah. the window is smaller. Oh, I see. He's he's yeah. So, that, that's where like I, that, so that's where I was headed, right? right, right so he's I seeing, he's seeing uh, 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 basically the same part of the sky, but the picture is now half the size. Right. Of course. And you can see fainter objects that way. And now, what there are other problems with that. You can imagine if it's raining really hard, your buckets overflow, and it's exactly the same thing yeah. with these kind of detectors. If too much light gets into each pixel, they can overflow and overexpose, and they'll actually will will flood the pixels near them with light. You see that all the time in pictures when um, it's, it's called blooming. You might see a bright object with spikes coming out of it. Uh, there are different causes for some of that, but in this case, that, that's, what, what's, that's what does that. So the, again, there are trade-offs. You can see fainter objects by binning, and it actually improves sort of your background noise. It, it, it's, it's kind of fuzzy and, and patchy looking. 
when you bin, you actually can reduce that a lot. But at, at the cost is that bright objects can can overexpose easily. And so the object that we're trying to and, see and one of N35 the is, uh, is, is an open cluster. So it's a cluster of stars. Oh. So you know, you're not going to see nebulosity, but hopefully we're going to see a fairly pretty collection of stars. So just to go oh, back to what Phil was looking. saying about um, CCD detectors, if you've ever used a digital camera, you've probably hit that annoyance of you click and then you wait while it's reading it out. Well, the reason that it takes time to read it out is it has to literally pour the data from one bucket into the bucket next to it. And only the last bucket has detectors in it to say, I know how much is in this bucket. So you can imagine this entire grid of buckets where only one set of the buckets has markers on it to tell you how much water is in the bucket. And you have to fill those buckets, read them out, then dump the water, and then move all of the contents of the, the buckets over by one. This is called the readout process. And if you read out an image too quickly, just like if you dump bucket to bucket too quickly, you end up sloshing water, or in this case, sloshing the signal from the stars all over the place. So a slow readout on your camera means higher quality images and more suffering because you're waiting, the ne you're waiting to be able to take that next interesting picture. It, Speaking it, of suffering, how are you doing, Mike? Uh, my fingers are getting a little numb. <laughs> oh. Is it cold there? We need to like get astronomy cast gloves and hats and scarves to send no, to all of these poor schmoes. Yeah. <clears throat> one you. of the things I deal with we a lot. We love you for doing this. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mike. <laughs> yes. Um, one of the things I wind up doing a lot is is uh, having to to debunk claims that are made because people don't understand their equipment or they don't know what they're looking at when 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 SOHO or SDO these NASA and European satellites are looking at the sun. They get all kinds of weird optical effects and, and weird digital effects because of the way the detector works. People think you point your camera at something, you push a button, and then you get a faithful representation of what they saw. It's not like that at all. There's all kinds of processes. I mean, Pamela's laughing because I know as, a, as, a, as an observer, she's gone through the pain of this. When I, you know, I, 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 my master's degree was using a ground-based telescope where I had to I had never done this before. Digital detectors were brand new, and I had to figure all this stuff out. And then um, yeah. I started working on Hubble, and I had no idea what kind of pain that this was. Because yeah. when you have really sensitive detectors, it's incredible what you have to deal with. You, you would get your observations. It might be weeks or months before you've, able, you've been able to put them in a condition where you can, you can analyze them correctly. It was horrifying. Yeah, this it, it takes is a actually lot of processing to get this right. This is actually where we're, we've been having a lot of delays with the icehunters.org project. It's a citizen science project to find Kuiper Belt objects. And we've been learning more about the camera on Subaru than any of us ever wanted to know because there's all sorts of strange image and noise features that in order to find excruciatingly faint Kuiper Belt objects, we have to correct for. And I know personally the thing that's always annoyed me the most is Sometimes you're trying to look at a really faint object, so you move your CCD chip to get a nearby bright star right off the edge. But then that light from the bright star comes in and hits the side of your telescope and then creates this splash of light across your detector. This is called an internal reflection. And so you can't see where the sucker's coming from, and you have to think back when you're reducing your data to, oh, that's right, I moved that bright star off the side of the frame, but it's still ruining my day. <laughs> so this is the uh, this is probably the best view you're going to be able to get, Mike. I think so. I'm not sure how close I am to it. Are we looking at an open cluster then? Yeah. 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 Okay. There aren't any globular clusters up right now. Yeah. Forgive me. I'm horrible at remembering what Messier number uh, attaches is to what this object. This is M35. Um, so the difference between open and globular clusters is open clusters are actually what the Orion Nebula will look like in the future. So the, the Orion Nebula, it's, it's a star-forming region. Over time, all of the gas that you saw, that beautiful gradient in the background behind the stars, all of that gas is going to collapse into stars. And over time, as the entire cluster orbits around the galaxy, the stars are going to get separated. So if you want, you can go out on a night like tonight 
and look at the Orion Nebula with your eyes and see a cluster in the process of forming. You can look at the Pleiades with your eyes and see something that's a few million more years along the way, um, a much older and adolescent system. And then you can look at the Hyades cluster. And the Hyades cluster, which is, um, look at the eye of Taurus the bull. It's a nice burnt orange star, which if you're a University of Texas graduate like me, you know it's the hook and horns color. Um, so look at, look at the Hyades cluster, and that's an extremely old open cluster, and it's been almost completely torn apart by its rotation or its orbit about the Milky Way galaxy. So M35 is one of these systems that you just can't quite see with your eye. So this is, this is the feature of Orion, or the Orion Nebula, not the constellation. What do you think about t trying Pleiades? I know we keep talking about Pleiades. Uh, I'm, I moved up. Uh, Way too big. The zenith here is M37, and it's pretty saturated in clouds, which is why you see the yeah. background brightness fluctuate a lot. Um, I think. Um, is it M64 that's another open cluster that's fairly tight? Uh, let's see. I love my go-to. No, that's a spiral nebula, the Black Eye Galaxy. Okay, there's an M60 something that, that I want to say is an open cluster. Are you sure 64 is a spiral yeah, nebula? 64 is the black eye nebula, uh, black eye galaxy. Mm. Okay, so yeah, I'm completely yeah. not remembering Messier numbers, and I've ordered a book to fix this. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so someone recommended the Beehive cluster, but it probably would look the same as the cluster, the open cluster that we just looked at. So that's why I'm saying, like, and let's take a crack at Pleiades. I mean, the problem with this is it's almost like this telescope is too good for Pleiades because it's just going to look... You know, probably won't be able to even see the whole thing. I'll tell you what, though, it might look nice in the finder scope, even though this, the quality of this finder camera is not so great. So the beehive will be awful low right now. Yeah. Um... I mean, part of what it is about like just doing something like a nice double double? <coughs> What's the double double in Ursa Majoris? Alzor and Mizar and and Alcorn the twins. Mizar? Yeah. Is that Pleiades there? Yeah, and no, this is in the finder scope here. This is right? in the finder scope. Yeah. So this is one of those objects that looks a lot better in a pair of binoculars than it does yes. in a telescope, and. And this is, so the one that Mike has just put over top is his, is his finder scope. And it's actually a telescope about this long. And uh, he's got his camera set on, on the side of it. And so you can see, when you look up into the sky, Pleiades is pretty visible with the unaided eye. And uh, it almost looks better with your eyes than it does even through a telescope. Binoculars make it look really nice. <clears throat> Okay. Well, Let's and if you can rotate this in your head, you can see this is actually the Subaru car signal symbol, where the bright star in the lower right is the star that's normally on the left in the middle of the Subaru car si symbol. So if, if you're feeling brave, Google, Google Subaru symbol and then rotate it um, in your mind, and, and you can see this is actually it. It's, it's kind of awesome when you get to randomly learn the foreign name of a right. constellation by buying a car. <laughs> when you look at it the, from the point of view of, of Japan, it looks, it looks the same as the yes. logo, right? Yeah. Um, well, I think, I, then I, then I think I've been put in my place with, uh, with Pleiades, so maybe we should go back to the moon and, uh, and sort of close out with the moon for this observing night. Can you, Mike, can, you, can you pull off the moon again? Yes, I can. <clears throat> and hopefully we can get that twin view, right? So we can get that finder scope view first and then get the, uh, the detailed yeah, view. Next, next time we do this, I will get it set up so that it's a little bit more like that. Well, like I said, I mean, next time we're going to, hopefully we'll have multiple telescopes. We'll have, we'll have all kinds of stuff. You can actually see the clouds moving by there. See that? Those are the clouds yeah. moving past the moon there. Oh, yeah. Pull that one out of the way. Now we're back on the... This is the 14-inch here, but let's... A little overexposed, I think. Oh, just a bit, yes. So one, one of the first diagnoses of having light pollution is clouds are brighter than sky. If you're somewhere truly dark, the clouds are darker than the sky. Hey, Fraser, in the chat room, I threw in a link. 
One of one of a uh, woman following me on Twitter took a screen grab of M42, and uh, you might want you can throw that as a as a comment if you want into the into the stream. Where's the, sorry, where's that? In the chat room in in the limited hangout. There oh, we there we go. There's Plato. Wow. See, I wasn't fibbing. Those are a lot of stuff. A lot of clouds moving past there. Yeah. It's amazing, though. You can still see so much detail. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, that's sweet. Look at those mountains poking out. Yeah. Let's go. It's a. Uh, it's romantic. It's uh, <laughs> speaking of romantic. Look at that heart-shaped crater there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Did you see that? Or actually, so you can look at it as a googly-eyed face if you look at the two craters above it. Yeah. So you have the heart-shaped one as the mouth, and then the two craters above. So it's like a googly oh. face with its tongue sticking yeah, out. Yeah, see that? You're looking right here? Yeah. Yeah, so there's the mouth, then you see the tongue going down, and the two uh, kind of darp or dwarp, or however you say that My Little Pony word, uh, of the eyes up above it. Uh, I, think oh, that's the I think it looks like a heart. Right. Oh, right. Crater oh, above a mouth. I mean, you talk about heart-shaped mouths. We are getting clouded out. Yeah. Oh, but if you like look at that crater there? that's right on the edge on the right, you can see the central peak in the middle, and you can just see the shadow of the rising yeah. sun ca that's casting into, on yeah. the far side that's of the crater. It. Oh, that's oh no. <laughs> Good night, moon. Hello, Good night, moon. Wow. <laughs> All right, well, I think, you know what, we've been, we've been running this for all, close to two hours now, and I think we've probably frozen Mike solid, so I think I'm going to have to call this fun to a, to a close. We had some, uh, some good views. <laughs> Some uh, some bad views, but it was great. And again, thank you very much, Mike, for both uh, uh, sort of providing the views tonight and as well, uh, you know, working uh, with me this afternoon to try and get this closer. And that's great. And thanks, Phil Absolutely. and and Pamela, for providing the color commentary. Feels like we're watching some kind of sports event or something. I don't know for nerds. This is so <laughs> cool. I'm, yeah. This is great. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, but in this case, we're rooting for both sides, <laughs> except for the clouds. Yeah. We're booing yeah. the clouds. We are yeah. booing the clouds, yes. Yeah, all right. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining, and thanks, everyone, for watching. And, you know, I hope you guys find this entertaining, um, and we will continue to sort of stumble or fumble our way forward to getting some kind of really cool live astronomy experience with uh, lots of telescopes and lots of people. And, again, if you're watching this and you think you can take a crack at this, we would love to have your help. If you can get the view from a telescope into a webcam and into a Google Plus Hangout, we, uh, we would love to have you participate. It would be really fun. The more telescopes, the better. Uh, and they don't fun. have to be huge. No, no, no. Yeah, no. Just, it's more just about the setup. It's more about getting a nice, stable setup with a webcam that's getting that view that's coming in. And then, you know, you might have a smaller telescope, but much better seeing, or you have darker skies, or the atmosphere is treating you nicely, and you'll get a better view. So, you know, really it's about being able to just kind of technically get the view from your telescope into the webcam and into the Hangout, and then golden. And so people have been contacting me, and then just, you know, we've been setting up a little Hangout and seeing what we can, what we can do, and then we're kind of going back and fine-tuning it. So, and we'd we'll love to hear your feedback. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Pamela. Yeah, Thanks, Bill. I'm happy to do it. And we'll, uh, and we'll see you guys next time when we figure this out.